time over to Dr. Erickson, and I will just introduce her. Actually, as we're short on time, in your yellow agendas, you have biographies for all of the presenters. You have bios. I'd like you to read Janet's. I will just say this briefly. Dr. Erickson is the first alumna of American Heritage School to become a board member. Uh, founder Shirley Anderson is her grandmother. Shirley, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, is LaDawn here? Janet's mother. She was also, she's out there. She was also a board member and, and a teacher and administrator. It's just so, so many things here. And here we have a third generation of um, a heart and a mind who has grown deeply in this principle approach, gospel sod. And she has been a teacher of teachers here for many years, including one of the first who, for me personally, um, helped me to have a watershed breakthrough with the power and uh, the practicality of our principal approach. So without further ado, Dr. Janet Jacob Erickson. It's always, always humbling to be here. It's such an honor. I, and I, every time I walk into these meetings, I feel such a profound spirit of commitment and desire to bless your children and your students, to give your, your heart to help you build the community in this way. It's humbling for me. I want for just a minute as we start, you should just know right now that I today I'm not going to talk about the seven principles that will be tomorrow, but I'm going to be talking about the methods, and as the title says, methods to match a mission. And tomorrow will be principles to match a mission. As we start out, I want for you to just take a moment and write down your answer to this question. What do you want most? in the lives of your students, in the lives of your children, to happen. What do you want most for them? What is the deepest part of your heart, your desire for them? Stop there, and I'd like to just get your responses for a minute. Somebody that would be willing to say yes. Righteous intelligence with action. Thank you. Beautiful. Another. Yes. To be self-sustaining and strong in the gospel. Thank you. Beautiful. To have a love, love for God and an understanding of his principles that will prepare them to serve. Thank you. Yes. To have a love, a, a full life with a loving companion that will help them to return to the presence of Father in heaven. And to fulfill to the utmost their mission in life. Thank you so much. deep into their heart, that they'll be able to draw on that well of living water and they're faithful to the end. Thank you, Chris Ann. Beautiful, powerful. Lady. One last one. Thank you. A sense of self and what their place is in Heavenly Father's plan. I'm humbling to hear these beautiful desires for your students and children. And what I want to start out with is to tell you that that is the mission of American Heritage School. You have come to a place where your desires for your children, your desires for your students, are in line with what the mission of the school is. When uh, Gaylord Swim, Brother Gaylord Swim, created the mission statement, you will identify your heartfelt desires in this mission statement. The first of which, which is that those children will be helped through their parents to be useful in the hands of, the, of God in building his kingdom. You've identified that feeling, that they will be able to discern right from wrong, truth from error, that they will be able to learn to develop character and self-discipline of mind and body. You talked about being self-sustaining, that they'll be able to develop 
the basic academic knowledge and skills to make self-education a lifelong pursuit. With such a glorious and grand mission statement, with, with such a deep desire for our children, there must be methods, if you will, we're going to use that word method, in order to obtain that kind of goal, that type of mission. And those methods have to match that mission, be that quality, be that deep themselves. When my grandfather, as I was searching to, to help us talk about the mission statement, I found this statement from my grandfather, given in the 1970s, he stood before this group of teachers who were not getting paid very much and who were just committed there to help, uh, help children to grow, and this is what he said. The American Heritage School was established for the primary purpose of teaching faith in God and obedience to his commandments. Every other purpose is secondary to this. I was struck by this because I and Grandpa loved America, and he wanted children to grow up with a love and appreciation for the providential plan of God in America's story. But the very first thing he said was not about America. It was that children would learn to have faith in God and become obedient to his commandments, of which the story of America is part. Those two parts, developing faith and obedience to his commandments, are what create character. Elder Richard G. Scott gave this talk uh, a couple of conference sessions ago that was very striking. He said, the pattern of the Lord is for his children to make decisions based upon eternal truth. That is what our quest is as teachers, is to help children learn truth that they might develop faith and obedience so that they can develop character. This is what I'm going to skip to the next slide. Elder Scott continued. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going backwards for you. Here's the first one. I'm going to skip to the next slide that says this. God uses your faith to mold your character. Character is woven patiently from threads of doctrine, principle, and obedience. That is what the quest of American Heritage is, to teach doctrine and truth so that children could develop the kind of faith that would lead to obedience and from that would follow Christian, Christ-like character. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to this slide. That is, in fact, the, pur pur the purpose for the pursuit of truth, that we can develop Christ-like character. Without truth, we cannot have the opportunity to be free. Now, I, I've reflected often on my experience, experience of going to graduate school at the University of Minnesota. I've done both of my earlier degrees at BYU, and I was pursuing a PhD at the University of Minnesota. And I often heard comments before I went to that university from other BYU students and from others who were not connected to BYU <clears throat> that it, was, it would be hard to feel like you had all the truth if you were restricted <clears throat> to just the truths of the gospel taught at BYU, and that it was restrictive. And how could I consider myself qualified to understand things in the world if I did not have exposure to all of the ideas of the world? How many of you have heard that? fear as you brought your children to American Heritage or taught here, right? I will never forget sitting in class with other fellow students who I deeply cared for who were not LDS. And we, as we sat and learned from the world's teachings, which had the presupposition that there was, in fact, no truth, that all truth was relative to the person's thoughts and feelings and ideas. And we all sat there, and I remember leaving the class and thinking, I didn't learn anything, and I couldn't see anything. Every, everything seemed gray. Everything was equal, and so everything was gray. There was no reason to even be sitting there, in a sense, because there was nothing to really pursue. All of it was equal, and that no pursuit would make anything better than anything else. And when I left, I had this thought, without light, without truth, how can I possibly discern anything that is presented before me? We have to have light to see dark from light, to see color, to see anything, to make any images become clear. There has to be light for our eyes to do that, just as there has to be light in order to see or learn or grow. There must be truth. And that is why a student who comes prepared with truth is given the capacity 
to actually learn. Otherwise, we are all left in the darkness of grave. There's no, nothing to pursue, and there's no reason to pursue it, because there is no truth to pursue. I felt sorry for my fellow classmates, because when they, would be, they also had that feeling there was no meaning in what they were pursuing, because there was no quest for truth. There was no truth to pursue. We have to have the light in order to see what we want to see, what we need to see. And without that light, there is no freedom. How can we possibly know the way to choose that would lead to freedom if we don't have that presented before us? It would be like trying to play chess with no knowledge of how to win the game. There is no freedom in order to play the game unless you know how to play it, unless you know the truth. And so that is necessary in order for us to become free. That is why the Lord himself said that. I will give you the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The full, I'll skip to the next slide, the full realization of human potential by strengthening families in their pursuit of truth and obedience to it is our quest. You talked about your children realizing the fullness of their God-given potential. <coughs> that is the quest of the school by strengthening families in their ability to do that. This demands, now one of the questions that immediately comes up is, well, if the purpose of this school is to teach faith and obedience, where's the academic knowledge in all of that? Aren't we about academic excellence? And as you know, and could answer easily, could there be truth without academic excellence? Could there be a fullness of realization of human potential if we did not give them all that was finest and purest and best? Could there be freedom without the light to see? And that demands the very best. That's why the school is also committed inherently to excellence in academic pursuits. And so, of course, that leads to us uh, the, the conclusion that learning truth is the essence of godliness. And as the mission statement for BYU says, the very first line is to assist individuals in their pursuit of eternal life. Because eternal life is learning, is knowledge. I love this statement from Elder Bednar from last year's 2009 ensign. The overarching purpose of Heavenly Father's great plan of happiness is to provide his spirit children with opportunities to learn. The atonement of Jesus Christ and the agency afforded to all of the Father's children through Redeemer's infinite and eternal sacrifice are divinely designed to facilitate our learning. Satan is in direct opposition to this. He seeks our damnation, which is to thwart our progress in learning, to keep us from being able to learn. God is all about our learning. And from President Brigham Young, the religion embraced by the Latter-day Saints, if only slightly understood, prompts them to search diligently after knowledge. There is no other people in existence more eager to see, hear, learn, and understand truth. All truth. The learning for which the church stands is the application of knowledge to the development of a noble and godlike character. There, President McKay brings it to its full conclusion. <laughs> We pursue truth that we may become like God, which is to have a God-like character, Christ-like character. And so that next slide says, the development of Christ-like character means learning through a Christ-like method. That's why as parents and teachers are always trying to become like the Lord himself so that you can teach your children through Christ-like methods to develop that Christ-like character. So I'm just going to go through what those fundamental methods are so that you and your families can be thinking about how to do that in their homes. And, and, and then as you go and watch teachers later today, you'll be able to observe their efforts to implement these Christ-like methods in helping children develop Christ-like character. The very first thing is that we as teachers, we as parents, become models of Christian character. Now that is a tall order, as all of you know. It requires, just as Holly talked about, that those who teach are first filled with the Holy Ghost. You all recognize as teachers that each of you have unique gifts. Sometimes it's easy, I remember as a teacher, faculty member at BYU, sometimes it was easy to be a little bit envious of someone else's gifts. But then to realize each of us have been endowed with gifts 
And the truth is, you parents, your child want no other teacher than you. It's always beautiful, I think, to see research on children who, who what they want is their own mother and father to teach what they love. What they want is your gifts, your capacities, your perspective, who you are, because they are you. They want the best and finest that is in you, and that is true of all teachers. The beautiful, filling gift in all of this is that the Spirit is the teacher, and every one of God's children can be filled with His Spirit, that they may become an effective teacher. That is the only way. He rounds out the lack of whatever gifts we all might not have, enhances those that we do have, and enables us to be effective teachers. The Holy Ghost will teach our minds, and this is the second part of that, and fill our hearts where we desire to bless with love. The key to receiving the Holy Ghost is love. A love for those that we teach, a love for our children, a love for those who are around us. When we love them and desire their good, God will fill us with his spirit. We become his hands, his mouth, his eyes to help teach and bless his children. I believe that is the key to having the Holy Ghost, being filled with his love for our fellow teachers, for his children, for the parents of those children. With that love, he will fill us with the capacity to bless them through his spirit. I remember the state president asking me one time, Jenna, when is it you feel the spirit the most? And I admired the state president very much, and I remember sitting there thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's when I read the scriptures, and I knew that that was a powerful source of the Spirit. Maybe it's when I go to the temple. I also knew that was a powerful source of the Spirit. But most importantly, I knew that I, I felt him teaching my mind what to say and what to do for another person when I loved them and wanted to help them. And in that moment, that was, if I saw his help, Heavenly Father, that this person has come to me with a need that I don't have the answer for. I don't know what to do for them. He would fill my mind with what to say and do, and I would feel it powerfully. That is how you will feel the Spirit the most, because you love your children, you love your students, you love the teachers that you teach with, you love the people that you engage with. The Lord will fill you with the Spirit then. This love, brothers and sisters, you know, does not come easily. You've all had moments of great impatience as students. <laughs> great impatience with children, and wondered and wanted to feel the kind of love you the Lord wanted you to have. He sets us up that way to fail, I'll just tell you, because he wants us to know we need his mercy in order to succeed. He is the only way we can have that kind of love, and it's through his mercy that we will have it. And so the key, the third piece is, I want to love this person. I want to love this student as I know I should right now. Give me thy mercy. I need thy mercy in order to love in a way that I need to, to have the Spirit teach me what to do. Elder Bednar said this a couple of conferences ago, praying, studying, gathering, worshiping, serving, and obeying, all the things we do to try to live good lives, this list of commandments that we're given to obey. For the Jews, it's 613 commandments. And they can see only that the purpose is to obey those commandments. We know more because of the restored gospel. All of that are not isolated and independent items on a lengthy gospel checklist of things to do. Rather, each of these righteous practices is an important element in the overarching spiritual quest to fulfill the mandate to receive the Holy Ghost. All of it is that we can have the Holy Ghost with us. Fundamentally, all gospel teachings and activities are centered on coming unto Christ by receiving the Holy Ghost in our lives. That is humbling, brothers and sisters. It means that every day when we walk into that classroom, when we know we need help from a higher power. Every time we present ourselves to our children, when we wake up in the morning, we know we need help from a higher power. Okay, that's the first key. Second, the second piece that's part of developing faith and obedience that leads to Christ-like character is that we teach providence. We teach that God is a provider. He sees our needs before they are even made known to us and makes a way whereby those needs can be filled. 
We can't talk enough of that to our children. We can't talk enough of it to our students. How can they build faith in one they do not know loves them and cares and provides for them? And so the key here in American Heritage is to teach a providential orientation to each subject, each literature piece, each historical account, by demonstrating and discussing how the event reveals the providence of God and how providence is revealed in the history of the development of the subject area, how, how we can watch his hand in mathematics, in science, in history, in literature, and in the lives of the people that he gave knowledge to to bring about truth in those areas. As you know, when you walked into a classroom, one of the most striking things about a classroom here at American Heritage is to look at and see that providential timeline in the, in the back of the room, in the front of the room, and to see how teachers point children to watching the Lord's hand. Nothing has been without his care. Not a piece has been left without his perfect omniscience and knowledge, foreknowledge. And so our great objective is to teach our children that they are literally carried within the palms of his hands, that this earth is carried in the palms of his hands, that there's nothing outside his influence and care. And we do that in a hundred million ways when we set children before food at a table, acknowledging the hand of God and helping us to receive that gift that we've been given. We cannot talk enough of his providence. The third thing, and Holly referred to this, and she's referred to all these things. And that is that all teaching is grounded in the four R process. I remember when Elizabeth, my sister who just joined the, the administration here, was she'd known for years about the four R process, but when she had worked extensively with other other courses in helping develop a Socratic method. Sometimes you heard the Socratic method referred to this ability for people to learn to reason the way Socrates wanted. And Liz, when she found the four R method, said, "This is far better than our best efforts. It is that that uh, cliche critical thinking. This is deeper than critical thinking, but it is critical thinking. And as children learn to four R, then they can learn to do what." What I told you, we had such a hard time doing at the University of Minnesota to actually see and learn, discern right from wrong, truth. You know those four R's are to research, reason, relate, and record. And can you see how clearly what happens through that process is we develop faith, which leads to obedience in relating and recording. And that is the development of character. So all of this aligns with what our overall mission is, methods to match that mission. Holly referred to research, and I'm going to clarify <clears throat> one thing that I have learned about research as I've, as I've been preparing for today. We often in American Heritage talk about researching original sources. That's important because any of you who have studied history or biology or other subjects will know that a textbook is written through the lens of another person or a series of editors. And all of those filtering processes, like the translation of the Bible, can remove truth, right? And, dis and, and distort the intent of the original author. And so we focus a lot on going to original sources. What did this person originally say so it's not filtered through another lens? Now that, that and, and I'm not going to be critical of putting that as part of research, but it is not fundamentally research. Fundamentally, research is the process of studying the scriptures, the word of God, to know truth. In the process of research, we are studying to know truth. What is the truth? The light from which we look at everything else. And so once we have researched and deduced those principles of truth, then we can reason. And so it's in reasoning that we carefully consider, ponder, question a subject area, question original sources, question other sources, to identify how those principles play out. And so you all know as you're teaching, you'll have, you'll, I heard Karen Richardson say this, you'll start from a principle that you want these children to have deeply internalized. And as you're reading a book, you will watch, you will reason through how that principle is played out in that book or not. Or you will reason how this subject of science, the cell structure, how it illuminates the principles that have been researched from the scriptures. 
Are you following? We have to have the truth to start with. And it's not that you spend half your day reading the scriptures, although that probably wouldn't do us any harm and a lot of good, but that you are always teaching the truths of the scriptures and the word of God. And you're always feasting, in a sense, on the word of God. And then as you're reading and studying everything else, you are reasoning where you can see those principles of truth that you have researched from the scriptures. And so what happens is reasoning and reasoning the principles in each subject area enables the student to discern through truth from error. But they have to have the truth to start with, to see the error. Identify cause to effect. That's something that has been eliminated from our learning, this removal of the notion that things have consequences. How many times are you telling your child, this is to help you see it. choices have consequences. We can't avoid them. I honestly believe, brothers and sisters, that Satan's plan was not to coerce us to do right, as much as it was to remove consequences. That we would, have, in essence, live in gray, much like our world lives in gray today, as if there were no consequences to our actions. And that would leave us without agency, because there would be no issue to help us discern right from wrong. Nothing with which to use our agency. All the consequences would be removed, in essence. And he wants us to be blinded to cause to effect. He wants us to be ignorant that there are, in fact, laws that govern and that things that we choose to do will lead ultimately to an effect. That's what reasoning is to help children to do. And as they study in the subject, they watch it play out. They watch how the cell in that remarkable process of unity, each part of the cell working in unity. And if one part does not fulfill its role, the entire cell is left defunct, right? Cannot carry out its work. That's a beautiful principle there. And, and you can see from mathematics, in history, in literature, of course, you're watching this cause to effect, this uh, discerning from truth to error, the movement from internal to external, that what things are on the inside is reflected on the outside. It destroys that law that private life doesn't matter in public life, right? What the cell is in the inside is what it will be on the outside. What a person is in the inside is what they will reflect on the outside. So that's another part of reasoning. Internal always leads to external. If we cannot govern in our own personal hearts, we cannot govern others righteously. And, and so all of that is part of reasoning, cause to effect, internal and external, discerning right from wrong, watching how things play out. And of course, you know, the next beautiful thing is relate. Now, teachers, you have studied this. You've done it a lot more than I have. You taught it this way. So I hope it's not my day to go over it. I hope what you will get is a vision of how powerful these methods are. They are methods to match a mission. And you will desire to become expert in your ability to help children go through this farming process, to see providence and your own self to be filled with the spirit. Relating is the third one. The process of identifying the meaning and application of each principle to our own lives, to our own conscience and our stewardship. I remember my sisters um, in a homeschool class, they were doing the farming process and they were reading um, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, a dark and difficult book with powerful principles, and that the teacher had asked them to go home and think about the kinds of things that they prayed for, and to write down the things that they prayed for often. What you saw is this teacher taking the principles that they were studying about, the little things they were studying about, and helping them first and foremost to apply them in their personal life. What good does it do us to study it if we do not internalize and obey the truths that we're taught? That is the key to developing character, faith, obedience, and then Christ-like character comes of that. And so relating involves asking, how can I see this principle in my life? What can I do to internalize the truth of this, of this principle? How can I become better at living this principle? And the Holy Ghost will invite that student to desire to do that. The last part, of course, is recording. The process of recording through writing, reporting, or illustrating the principle to preserve its evidence coherently and persuasively. I love this idea that we must record it 
to have its evidence preserved. That's why Elder Scott, of course, always talks to us about keeping a journal, a scripture journal, as we're reading, because the Lord can enlighten our minds as we're studying and writing and recording. And then there is evidence of those principles learned. It's why a child who comes home from school learns a principle. It's a powerful, powerful thing for a parent to say, did you write about that in your journal? Take a minute to write that principle you've learned because its evidence will be recorded. That record will be recorded. And of course, the ultimate goal is that this is recorded in the heart, in the tablets, the fleshy tablets of the heart. As the principle is recorded, it becomes etched in the character of the learner. And can you imagine a more powerful thing than to have that notebook to take home with this evidence of principles learned that one can keep working on applying in their life? So we talked through, the first thing was that we become prepared by being filled with the Holy Ghost. The second thing was that we teach the providence of God and help you develop faith. The third was these core principles, the four RA method. The next one is the word study methodology. You'll have students do word studies. Holly's probably done hundreds of word studies in her life. You might think, this is nuts. What in the world with all this copying out of dictionaries and such? Why the focus on words? It is because words are the clothing of principles. They are the dress, the clothing that we have for understanding principles and truth. We couldn't understand truth if we didn't have language. That's why language is the great gift God has given to us. Conscience and language. Because language enables us to reason and to think. We have words that clothe principles, and from them we can understand, articulate, and share truth. Those words are very important. So what a word study enables you to do is to deeply study principles. You won't always find the word mathematics in the scriptures, but you will find words in the dictionary definition of mathematics that you will find in the scriptures, such as one and number and counting. And from that word definition, you then can learn, as we talked about, to research the principles of the scriptures that have to do with mathematics, science, language, literature, whatever that topic area is. And any of you that have done a word study know what happens to your heart as you do a word study. All of a sudden, everything makes more sense. I so appreciated Sister um, Dalton and her efforts to help the young women of the church understand that the word virtue means power. That's a word that's lost in our current deck dictionaries, but it's retained beautifully in Webster's 1828 dictionary. Virtue is power. Virtus, because he goes back to the Greek and Latin roots of words, is power. And what that does to change a young woman's sense of what virtue is, without virtue, I am powerless. And that happens, as all of you know, over and over and over again. Word studies are core to doing research. They're core to researching the principles from the scriptures. They enable us to tie the subject area to the scriptures that we can discern truth. And then with that truth, we can reason, principles, that we let then relate to our lives and record for evidence. The steps of the word study, we look up a word in the Noah Webster 1828 dictionary, we research the word using the teachings of the living prophets, we research the word in the scriptures, and then that final thing is to write a personal definition of the word. Did you see for our in that process? So of course we're researching, we're reasoning out the principle, we're relating it to our lives, and then we are recording it as evidence for what we preserve. That's why the word study captures all the parts of that four hour method. Now you teachers are probably wondering, or wanting to ask, do you have any idea how long it takes to do a word study effectively? And where in the world do we have time to do a word study? And so you're very careful and precious in how you use these, but I don't want you to forget this is key to the foray process. This is key to researching and understanding the principles. And then, of course, we have the notebook methodology, which is the process for recording the truths that we've learned that allows that child to become a self-teacher and then to teach other people. And I can't tell you how precious the, the notebooks have been that my sisters kept from all of their literature books. 
We've taken them almost every year to the Shakespearean Festival because nowhere in any Cliff's Notes or any interpretation of Shakespeare are you going to get those precious truths. They are gold to us. And so your students will take these, these things that the Holy Ghost has been their tutor in, in writing and recording the principles learned, and they will become powerful. I promise you that is what they will take to their own children and their own future classes. There will be no better book for them to take. The notebooks are powerful. And finally, the great final one is that a, a core to this, once we've done, we've prepared as teachers, we've taught products, we've done the foreign methodology, we've done word studies to help research truth, we've created evidence of that research through notebooks, we have this powerful thing that we call learning celebrations. Celebrations are key. I don't think families can do enough celebrating the learning that happens. Celebrations are where we record it in through all the senses, the learning that we've experienced and enjoyed together. And, and that becomes the source of the memories of the power of that learning. That's where children, they look, although you're doing all kinds of things in your family to build unity, the way they can capture it in their own memory is through the ritual that you do. It's that ritual on Valentine's Day. It's the ritual that you do on Christmas. It's the ritual of birthdays. Though you're filling their day with all of these beautiful learnings, that ritual is the way the brain and the soul records that experience. And that's why celebrating learning is so important. It's key, along with notebooks and forearm and word studies, that we, that we always remember to celebrate. I just want to end with my testimony that these brothers and sisters are methods to match a mission, a sacred mission. Mission that will go to the deepest desires of your heart for your children and your students. I promise you that you are filled with love. The Holy Ghost will teach your heart to say and do as you seek to help them learn by faith and obedience that you will develop a Christ like character that will become the foundation for this nation and for the kingdom of God. I your testimony that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Erickson. Uh, we have time to take a break, and uh, if you will, at the break, go ahead and grab a map of the building, because when you come back from the break, we're going to gather here for a student share, and then we'll be going to classrooms, and uh, if you're trying to decide which classroom you'd like to go to after the break, and you want to think about it, if you look on your agenda, we have Laura Scholl, a high school teacher. This is 9th, 10th, 11th grade, range 12. Any high school interested there, room 406. Charlene Knight, this is upper elementary, 4th, 5th, 6th grade, 201. Esther Seibert, primary elementary, kindergarten, 1st, 2nd grade. Those would be perfect there. Um, room number 106. Angie McIntyre. Third grade, second, third, fourth grades, um, room 112, and Deanna Bingham also. Second, she teaches seven, second grade, but anything in there, first, second, third grade, the great uh, room number 110. So, uh, thank you to all of our presenters this morning. Uh, yes, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mrs. Yamada was summoned to jury duty this morning. <laughs> so those of you who were looking for a middle school breakout, that was our middle school breakout, I might recommend that you uh, try to attend uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Scholl's classroom um, or Mrs. Knight's, uh, which would be upper elementary there. We'll fit as many as we can into Ms., Mrs. Scholl, or Ms. Scholl's classroom and uh, just do the best we can. Yes. Sure. Laura Scholl, room 406. Charlene Knight, room 201. Esther Seibert, room 106. Angie McIntyre, 112. And Dan, room 110. There's maps right outside. Have a great. We'll be back here at, because they do represent a